This is Chris Carlson, and welcome to the Boulder Banking Podcast. My guest is Peter Cressy, Executive Director of the George Washington Leadership Institute. The GSBC Board of Trustees and Alumni Advisory Board recently met for their fall meeting in Mount Vernon, Virginia, and Peter led them through a day of leadership discussions centered around great historical leaders like Washington, Lincoln, Roosevelt, and Churchill. In my discussion with Peter, we talked extensively regarding the importance of leadership, examples of how great leaders dealt with tough times, and how bank leaders can lead during challenging times. Hey, Peter, thanks for joining us today. Well, Chris, I'm delighted to be with you and uh, look forward to our conversation. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to our conversation as well, Peter. But before we get started, can you give us a brief background of Peter Cressy? Well, I don't want to bore your audience, but um, uh, to be brief about it, you know, I could never keep a job. I've had a eclectic background, basically, with um, with four careers, all of which have been very satisfying to me. Certainly starts uh, with the Navy. I was um, one of the last folks to graduate from uh, Yale NROTC back in 1963, before they uh, Ivy League campuses. Uh, eliminated ROTC units during Vietnam. And then um, I'm happy to say they brought it back. But that was a great beginning. I never really expected to stay in the Navy, but I did. And, um, you know, I, I it ranged everywhere around the world, uh, chasing submarines, but a lot of shipboard duties as well, including I was the head of communications for the fleet when we were off of... Um, Vietnam for the fall of Saigon uh, in April of 1975, uh, the Cambodian uh, rescue, uh, the Mayaguez rescue, uh, very heady time, learned a lot. And uh, with Henry Kissinger having died yesterday, I'm kind of pleased to be able to say that at one point, it was the only satellite voice line that we had in those days actually had Henry Kissinger on the phone one day. And the very next day, uh, we had President Ford, who then uh, told the admiral to go ahead and uh, yank the ambassador from out of uh, out of the out, out of the embassy. Uh, I finished up uh, in the Navy um, during Desert Storm. I was uh, what we called Commander Fleet Air Mediterranean, Commander uh, NATO Air Mediterranean, which meant I had charge of all the bases and all the logistics. And in between, I had uh, all kinds of wonderful operational <clears throat> and, and Washington assignments, including a time at the State Department, a time as head of liaison to the House of Representatives, uh, and of course, Pentagon duty. So I had the full flush of it. I left the Navy a little early because I got an opportunity. I had been, I'd finished my doctorate and was very interested in academia. And um, I got an opportunity to go to be the president of the Massachusetts Maritime Academy, which is part of the state college system in Massachusetts. That went well. A couple of years later, I was um, asked to go down and take over as the head of one of the UMass campuses, UMass Dartmouth, uh, down in in the blue collar area of Massachusetts. That was a great challenge. And um, that began my odyssey for ending up here because I was about to go to another great university and I'd been fighting under a shrinking and I got a call from the headhunter where I like to come back to Washington, which he knew was a preference for me. And the uh, great trade association, the trade associations are a big business here in Washington. The Distilled Spirits Council of the United States offered me the job to come in and head that up and to really drive social responsibility uh, through the industry as a way of creating cultural acceptance. And I took that job and had a great time at it. The very first year I was there, we got a call from Mount Vernon. Wouldn't the industry be interested in restoring George Washington's distillery? Well, who the heck knew that George Washington had a distillery? Now I'm a very careful decision maker, Chris. That took me one microsecond to say yes. You know how, what, talk about strategic agility, right? What a great opportunity uh, to have George Washington, the 
honor of our country on the side of the uh, appropriate use of distilled spirits. And we did. We restored his distillery. And I got very involved with George Washington. I've always, I, I majored in history and in American history in college. And um, uh, 16 years later, uh, I came down here to uh, run the executive programs here at the Washington Leadership Institute to help build this program. And and that's kind of the end of the story. I'm, I'm still here in my old age and I'm enjoying doing it very much. Well, tell us about the Washington Leadership Institute. Well, you know, the ladies of Mount Vernon have owned this place and run this place as a private institution, George Washington's home, since 1858. Um, it's one of the first great women's associations in America. Uh, they don't take any state or federal money. And they have done an extraordinary job of preserving Washington's home, the surrounding buildings, and about 425 acres. They have a model farm. Um, they have his distillery. They have his grist mill. All the things that show that he was a scientific farmer, uh, which helped tell the story of George Washington. And uh, over the years, they have developed a tremendous educational program. We have a teacher's institute that brings in 160 teachers every summer in groups of 20 and 25, try and get civics back in the classroom. Lord knows we need that. You know, you, as Washington said repeatedly, you can't have a democracy without an educated public. And it became evident about the time uh, that we built the presidential library here on the grounds at Mount Vernon, that, that we weren't doing enough in taking advantage of Washington's extraordinary leadership traits to fundamentally help America's senior leaders and emerging leaders across the broad spectrum from commercial to military to federal agencies to help them rethink how they lead and, and, and manage. And I came here about eight years ago, seven years ago, and we've really built up quite a practice. I mean, pre-COVID 2019, we had about 100 groups come through, something on the order of 3,800 senior and middle management uh, leaders. Uh, and it's been a great opportunity to use the great lessons of our founding era and the extraordinary leadership traits, the credibility, the integrity, the character of George Washington as a model for modern leadership. Well, Peter, there's obviously been some great leaders through history. And leading in times of crisis is obviously hugely important. What made leaders like Washington, Lincoln, Roosevelt, and Churchill so unique in this area? Well, as you and I have discussed, we got into COVID. I wanted to engage a lot of our previous CEOs who'd come here who ran important organizations, particularly trade associations who you know, cover the waterfront from, from retail to healthcare. And I wanted to engage them in helping us, helping them understand what were some of the key and important traits for leading in times of, of crisis and change. And I was obviously pretty familiar with Washington and I had seen some perspective. So I refreshed myself on Lincoln and Franklin Roosevelt and I've always had a fascination with Churchill. What I discovered on, on doing this study was eight fundamental traits that they all exhibited. But perhaps first and foremost was this remarkable recognition of the importance of maintaining the strategic vision and tying that strategic vision to both a sense of strategic patience and a sense of strategic agility. And, 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 and let me explain what I mean by that. And let's use Washington as the example. So as you come into the revolution, 
you're facing, Washington's facing an extraordinary crisis, right? It's, it's a wartime. So there's great danger for everybody. But there's also a political crisis. How do you go from being under a monarchy to a democracy? Cultural change, cultural crisis. How do you get the average man to, in those days, men, women obviously didn't have the vote. How do you get the average man to participate in democracy? And interestingly, and this is one of his great successes that we tend to fail to recognize, the financial crisis. How do you go from kind of a serf-oriented agricultural, pure agricultural economy that depended upon the banks of England to establishing your whole, your own holistic financial system? And one of Washington's great traits is his capacity to know what he didn't know and his capacity to delegate and how well he uses Hamilton. So he holds this strategic vision. So think about what it was at the beginning of the war. Win the war, of course, but, but win the war how? Win the war and end the war with the United Country. He was so clairvoyant about seeing that if we weren't united, that Spain would pick us off to the south, England and Canada would pick us off to the north, and we would split on our own accord along the demographic lines of the north, the south. And he, alone of all the founding fathers, recognized the pull of the west, that once people got across the Appalachians, got across the Alleghenies, their natural egress point to porch would be down the Ohio, the Mississippi River. Now, this, create, this, this makes a very important point. Strategic vision has to take into account all the factors, the political factors, the geographic factors, the economic factors, the cultural factors. Washington has this incredible vision of it. But even more importantly, think of what the most important thing he ever did. He stepped down from power at the end of the Revolutionary War. In Annapolis, just... 40 miles to the east from where I'm sitting now, two days before Christmas, 1783, he gives up power. Now, his nemesis, King George III, said immediately, if he really does give up power and go back to the farm, he must be considered the greatest character of the age. It's a remarkable example of someone leading and managing to their strategic vision. He never forgets this throughout the war. He's constantly reminding Congress that they're in charge, that he's not in charge. Um, so he's clear about that. Even when he becomes president, he's clear about that. Now, if you fast forward, Lincoln develops that same sense during the extraordinary crisis of the Civil War. And he exhibits this great patience, that this, this great vision and patience at the same time. And the vision is that we're going to be a united country, right? He's gonna, he's gonna absolutely come back to that. Roosevelt sees this challenge of World War II and the depression as this extraordinary thing of saving democracy and having capitalism work. And you see Churchill on the other side facing the, you know, the desperation piece. So it is this sense of vision and having that vision. And then the extraordinary ability to recognize that nothing goes according to plan. And you've got to be strategically patient. Think, think about the early days of the revolution. After Washington moves the troops from Boston to New York, knowing that that's where the British are going to invade. They, you know, think about it. July the 4th, 1776. Huzzah, huzzah. What an extraordinary celebration. We, the Declaration of Independence. Good Lord, only two months later, only two months later, the British have landed 100 warships, 330 supply and troop ships, over 30,000 trained troops, and they run us out of Long Island. They run us out of Brooklyn. They run us out of Manhattan. Washington is retreating, retreating, retreating. Crosses the Hudson, writes that famous letter to 
to um, John Hancock. You know, not 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 the world's most famous insurance agent, but the actual president of the uh, Continental Congress, and says, "Dear Mr. President, we are not going to win this war in one great stroke. We're going to have to build an army. We're going to have to train. We're going to have to get organized, and we're going to have to trade." time and space and let the enemy in a sense defeat itself that's exactly what he does he pulls the enemy down through new jersey now fast forward six months later five months later late december 1776 he's gone from 17,500 militiamen who's you know have, have gone home their, their enlistments were up they had to go back to the harvest down to about 3,500, he gets some reinforcements from uh, the Pennsylvania militia and New Jersey militia, and he's looking for that opportunity to strike. So he's combining this sense of strategic patience with strategic agility. And he sees that opportunity to cross the Delaware on Christmas Day, capture the Hessians. But then he goes further, lures the British down, into the second battle of Trenton and wins that one. And then very cleverly, by listening to his staff, decides to circle back 10 days later up an unknown back road and he captures Princeton. So now he's exhibited strategic patience coming down through New Jersey. He attacks demonstrating great strategic agility. And now once again, he goes back to patience. He said, okay, we, we don't want to risk our luck. Capture Princeton, we retired in the New Jersey Highlands. He did the same thing with Lincoln, with the Emancipation Proclamation, right? He writes the Emancipation Proclamation in, um, I think, 1861. And he's convinced, after, again, great listening skills, listening to his cabinet, uh, you better not do it now because you'll divide the North. And then we won't be able to win the war. And he recognizes, going back to that strategic vision, how important it is to maintain that notion of a united country. You know, later on, he makes the decision to, to launch it uh, later on um, a, a after a great victory. You know, you talked about the importance of strategic vision, strategic <clears throat> patience, strategic agility. Now, talk about the importance of collaboration that these leaders exhibited. Let me preface that by identifying those eight specific characteristics, which I mentioned at the top of our discussion, because all of them go to that essence of collaboration. First, that early effort to control anxiety and fear. That requires, number two, really effective communication. Honest, be realistic, but be positive. Three, to be a good communicator, demonstrate visibility, to demonstrate resolve, to demonstrate determination. All in that rubric of good communication and visibility. The fourth was the initial concept of an initial plan. The fifth is the notion of a long-term plan, which is much more difficult because it requires getting the data. You go back and look at what happened during COVID, right? So you saw some people being very effective visibly, some not so effective. And I wanna come back to that in a moment because there's, there's an important lesson in judgment of how visible to be. I mean, getting that long-term plan. I mean, you even wonder now, is the country developing a long-term plan for the next pandemic? Then the fundamental notion of pre-planning and then recognizing and capitalizing on opportunities such as what we're doing. Suddenly the world discovered you could work through Zoom um, and it's had a fundamental change. Uh, we learned that if you use the healthcare system, you use, for instance, some drug stores rather than setting up uh, Government inoculation systems, uh, drugstores with pharmacies were perfectly capable of doing inoculations. They did millions of them. All of that requires this notion of collaboration. Collaboration 
in my judgment, is a great force multiplier. Nobody can do everything by themselves. Collaboration requires um, an extraordinary sense of trust. Trust for the leader and, and trust for all the people that are uh, participating in them. When we go back, of course, from my tendency, as you understand, is to always use the, the Washington example. Critical notion is the ability to listen and the ability to generate trust. I mean, one of the greatest examples of collaboration was Washington collaborating with the French General Rochambeau to make that fateful decision to march all the way from White Plains, New York uh, to Virginia in the heat of the summer in 1781 and to capture the British Army at Yorktown. Uh, that was not Washington's original plan. The original plan was to reattack New York. And Rochambeau, a, a very different cultured Frenchman from Washington, was able to convince him through the interpreter that that wasn't going to work. Washington gets high marks for listening and for trust, and that's at the essence of it. Think about our own Bill of Rights. You know, the Bill of Rights was not created at the Constitutional Convention. Go back in time now, right? 1787, May, countries pulling apart, the war's over. We have different tax systems in each state. We have customs between each state. The states are not getting along. There are riots. They realize they have to create a federal government and they come together in Pennsylvania. Now, the amazing thing is between May and September, they get Article I legislative branch done, two uh, executive branch, Article Three judicial, four, five, and six. They can't get that all important final article, which is essentially a bill of rights to protect all of us from our own government because government, everybody was afraid of governments in those days. In a way, we still are. But Washington and Madison had such great prestige such great understanding and trust that they were able to say to all the delegates, look, go back to your state kind of conventions, your state assemblies, ratify the constitution, come back and the first Congress of the United States will pass a bill of rights. Can you imagine that today? I mean, think about that. The last amendment took 25 years to pass. The bill of rights is 10 amendments. So if you could say and almost jocularly that it would cost, it would take us 250 years to pass the Bill of Rights today. The other thing is compromise. And the great compromise, probably the greatest compromise um, in the history of democracy, democracy is um, so well displayed in the play Hamilton. And that is the decision, compromise, on where the U.S. capital would be and would there be a national bank. When you think about it, we've got to have a strong economy. And Hamilton and Washington know we need a national bank. Jefferson and Madison are quite nervous about that. And they're really nervous about having capital in New York City, which they already saw as much too powerful. And then that famous dinner, which is celebrated in the, in the play Hamilton, Jefferson brings Madison and Hamilton together. And Madison agrees to give the votes of the South for the National Bank. And Hamilton agrees to give the votes of the North for the capital in the South. Uh, an extraordinary sense of compromise. And finally, I think critical thing about collaboration is that it requires patience, it requires persuasion, and it, and it requires a much greater sense of civility than we have seen recently in American politics. And I think you know, one of the really great things in collaboration, and one of the essential requirements, is that sense of civility. Now, in 1795, 
in the middle of his last term as president, Washington writes a letter to a friend about political parties. He's very nervous about political parties. And he says, I fear that victory will be more important than truth. He, he sees the danger of political parties not being civil. Look at that famous statement by Lincoln um, in 1860, right after he was elected president, before he's inaugurated. He says, we will hold no harsh feelings toward those who voted against us. And that was a very nasty, nasty election. I mean, one of his own Republican primary opponents called him a long-armed hairy ape. But he knew above all else that civility was going to be required to bring the nation back together. So Washington develops this extraordinary ability to listen, and he becomes much more patient as an older man. And during the Constitutional Convention, he only speaks three times. He opens it, closes it, and he speaks once uh, on the subject of proportion. He does all his persuasion in private. He's very careful not to confront people. And you know, I'll, I'll tell you one anecdote, which I think is interesting. It, it takes me back April of 1975 during the fall of Saigon. I mentioned I was the head of communications for the fleet, and I had about a 120 young men and petty officers working for me. And at any given watch, we had about 20 of these young people on the old torn tape, tape, thicker tape crypto machines, waiting for that final secret message to come through to tell us, go ahead and pull the ambassador. And I had this one kid, sure he was a good kid, but he was 19 years old, maybe 20. He just couldn't keep his eyes on that machine. You know, and I just made lieutenant commander, so I had another half strike so I could be called commander, right? Oh boy, John Wayne. Finally, after a couple of days of frustration, I pull this kid out of line, Chris, and I read in the riot act, you know, you get your sorry butt back in there. Don't you take your eyes off that machine. It's life and death. And I figure I've, you know, done my duty to impress this on him. About 20 minutes later, an old chief petty officer, and you know, in the service, we have great reverence for chief petty officers and for master sergeants, if you're in the Army or the Marines, Air Force, pulls me aside and he said, uh, Commander, could I have a quick word with you? And I said, well, of course. I go aside, he says to me, he said, Commander, you're a fine young officer. I think you'll make admiral someday. But I've got to tell you, the more stripes you have on your sleeve, the quieter you have to talk. Chris, I never forgot that. Washington learns that himself. He's extraordinarily persuasive in private. That the very essence of collaboration. Don't confront people. Trust them. Delegate to them. Bring people together. Listen to their ideas. And then find the way to compromise. Well, Peter, given the the examples uh, that you have given us, and you take a look at what's going on in our political structure today, especially in Washington, how are we going to make it like it used to be, where we had great leadership and people did come together and collaborate and listen to each other? Is there hope, or are we just going to continue to go down this rat hole? Chris? Again, history is a great teacher. Uh, this is not the first time uh, we've had this period of nasty politics. We saw it within three years of Washington being elected president and serving reluctantly. He really was ready to retire. They begged him to come back. Um, I have seen newspaper articles where they're lambasting him, accusing him of wanting to be king. 
That was the last thing he wanted. But it was the political opposition. Fast forward in time to the Andrew Jackson era. Nasty, nasty politics in there. Obviously, the whole period of the uh, Civil War. Fast forward to uh, post-Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, These things tend to go in a sinusoidal way. And as Washington said, prior to his agreeing to go back to the Constitutional Convention, he said in at least two letters, one to John Jay and one, I think, to Mason, he says, uh, the fruit is not yet ripe. It's not bad enough yet. The states are not ready to give up their sovereign power. And I think that's what is likely to happen here. You know, we've gotten into this business of trading impeachments, which I think is a terrible way to govern. And I think most people do. But what has happened in a sense is that the vast majority of Americans are leading a decent life. They do not participate in political primaries. Maybe they vote in them, but they don't go to any primary meetings. Very few people do. I mean, when we come into the primary season, you think a lot of people are, but as a percentage of the population, it's very small. I'll bet it's way less than 5%. That means inevitably it goes to the people who care the most about a particular issue. And that means the primary system tends to be run Uh, by the fringes of both parties. Now, when there was great Satan out there, and we were all very nervous about the Cold War and the Soviet Union Empire, we tended to come together. I remember very well when I was the um, head of Navy liaison to the House of Representatives, the annual State of the Union speech. Ronald Reagan and the great Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill, the Democrat, were, were very good friends. Now, maybe it was because they were Irish and they enjoyed sipping a little Irish whiskey together, I don't know, but they had a great reverence for the offices they held. They had a great reverence uh, for the country. And they would come together. And that set an example. Uh, I often would go to events, to go to parties, social things, with Democrats and Republicans who were very good friends, even if they disagreed. That still does exist in the background on the Hill. But because of social media and because of where we are in this sinusoidal curve, uh, people are not as free to sort of express their affection for each other. I think that'll change. Whether that'll change in this next election or not, I don't know. But I think we're getting closer. I mean, we're seeing some effort. I mean, the very fact that Speaker McCarthy was voted out has forced uh, a number of of moderate Republicans uh, to do business with the Democrats. And, um, you know, political antagonists would say, oh, that's terrible. I think as a citizen, I think it's wonderful. So I always have hope for this country. Uh, We're in a bad patch, uh, but I think something will occur which drives us together again. Well, Peter, let's bring it back to the banking industry. What advice would you give to leaders within the banking industry when it comes to leading, especially during tough times? Well, let's go back to those eight fundamentals uh, that that I described. And, And let's also suggest that fundamentally uh, good leadership skills always play a role. So in times of crisis, and I think the banks and the federal system worked pretty well recently in that little banking crisis that started in California, get control of fear and anxiety. Now, you can do a lot of pre-planning for that kind of stuff. And that's one of those eight elements is to do your share of pre-plan. Be prepared for the inevitable crises that will come. You can't always predict them, but most of them you can. I think in the banking industry you can. So be prepared for that. And in doing that, be prepared to come together. That's not a time for bankers to be excessively competitive. 
that's the time for everybody to speak with one voice, compromise on issues, uh, to support each other in terms of, uh, you know, having the requisite cash on hand and, and some of those technical things, which uh, you bankers understand better than I do. Next, of course, is communication. Look, visibility is a fine art. And how much you communicate, which I said we should come back to, is a fine art. Let me give you two examples of that, Chris. The uh, uh, governor in New York during COVID started off quite well um, and was holding these briefings on a regular basis. Uh, New York was in the throes of it. Elderly were dying on a on a daily basis. But somewhere along the line, his communications got off. One, it may have been too much of it, surprisingly too much of it. Secondly, he lost some credibility because of a, of a scandal that he faced. Now, I want to compare that to Roosevelt. One of the first things Roosevelt did, remember, he wasn't dealing just with World War II. Before that, he had the Great Depression, which is right in the banker's alley. And he started doing these fireside chats. And of course, in those days, visibility was held by the radio. He was a master at it. He had a wonderful voice, that great sonorous voice, beautiful. And had a sort of a lilt to it. And, and mastered master radio, as did, as did Churchill, by the way. But after one particularly successful thing, one of his um, staffers, said, Mr. President, that was great. You should be doing this every week. And he said, uh, young man, if I did it every week, it would be commonplace. Nobody would listen to me. So it's mastering how much to communicate is clever, but communication is necessary. Visibility. People trust the people they know. And if you're a community banker and they know you and you're a part of the community, then Mastering that with collaboration, teaming up with other people in the communities that people know to give people a sense of stability is an ideal way to go forward. Now, having some kind of initial plan, and that's, that's key to being able to say, we've got the cash on hand to handle this situation, not to worry about. You don't have to run on, you don't have to have a run on the bank, right? That kind of thing. During COVID, yes, we can continue to operate. Here's what we can do. We can, we can still come to the bank. We can wear masks. We can separate. We can still have access. We can still keep commerce going. All those things. And banks play a big, 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 big role in that. The initial plan is critical. Now's the time to be thinking about longer term plans. How could we take advantage of the electronic system in the future to do that? Oh, by the way, what happens? If the grid goes down, how do we continue to bank? What, what are, how, you know, how, how do we get up and running quickly again? All those things have to be thought of. And then, of course, there is that whole business of credibility. Washington was so successful. Lincoln was so successful. Roosevelt so successful because they had an incredible, incredible amount of stored up credibility. So I think one of the things. And I think that is a great strength of community banks. I was so impressed with the people we had here at Mount Vernon last month. They are really sensible, honest individuals of high integrity uh, that not only care about their banks being profitable, of course, you got to be profitable, but they care about their community service. And I think building that credibility in good times then stands you in great stead in bad times. Well, Peter, you have given us so many nuggets. I, this podcast could go on for hours based upon this concept of great leadership, which I think uh, our country needs in all different sectors. However, if somebody has a question for you or maybe you'd like to uh, ask you for a resource, what's the best way for them to contact you? Probably by email. And my email, happy to give it to you, is P as in Peter, Pressy. My last name, C R E S S Y, at Mount Vernon, George Washington's home, easy to remember, uh, all lowercase, all one word, M O U N T V E R N O N dot 
org. I'll make sure I, I put that in the show notes. Uh, Peter, fascinating discussion today. I know you're a very, very busy individual, and I really appreciate you taking time out of that busy schedule to visit with us today. It's great to be with you. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Chris. Thanks, Peter.